Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Uh, please let me know if you have any issues uh, hearing us at any point. Uh, we will try to make sure that we're staying on time. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Uh, we, the American Society for Microbiology, Texas Medical Center, ASM, TMC, have teamed up with Taste for Science Houston and are really humbled and excited to be here today and bring you our COVID-19 webinar series. Uh, my name is Aisha Khan. I'm an infectious diseases scientist at UT Health and a co-host today. Uh, with uh, more than 3.3 million global cases now, of which 1 million cases and over 66,000 deaths are in the U.S. alone, uh, COVID-19, unlike any pandemic we've seen, has created a massive public health and economic crisis. And it's exposed holes in our system. Our most vulnerable communities, at-risk communities, have been hit the hardest, further exacerbating uh, inequity. So we, as scientists and healthcare workers, are cognizant of the nuances and of our privilege and really wanted to create the space for you, the public, to access data-driven answers. Uh, we're excited to work together with our incredible experts uh, who are here today uh, on the ground to break down the science behind COVID-19 and do some myth busting in our segment today based on the questions you submitted to us. So thank you so much for doing that. They were very insightful but we also want to have a sustainable path forward. So at the same time tomorrow, 2 p.m. Uh, Central, we'll discuss solutions to the current crisis, which includes testing, diagnostics, vaccines, and treatments, and shed light on science-driven long-term solutions. Uh, so we are better prepared for the next pandemic. Uh, so thank you to our experts, sponsors, everyone on our teams who's worked incredibly hard to bring this together. Uh, you can continue sending questions in the live chat, uh, sorry, the Q&A chat below. Uh, and if you like what you hear, please follow ASM-TMC and Taste of Science Houston on Facebook and Twitter and their website. Uh, Bailey, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm Bailey Kane, and I'm a PhD student at BCM and also another co-host for today. And I have the pleasure of introducing our three experts today. Um, and if you could please wave when I say your name, that would be really helpful for our audience. So first, Dr. Tony Piedra is a leading virologist and pediatric physician at BCM who's dedicated to developing new vaccines against respiratory viruses. And his lab has been critical to conducting COVID patient testing and has been working on developing a reliable serology test since the start of the pandemic. Our second expert is Dr. Blake Hansen, um, who is an epidemiologist or a scientist who studies how disease spreads at UT Health. And he uses statistical tools and computers to be able to answer biological questions. So for example, how we can track and curtail global transmission of infectious disease. And Blake actually is leading surveillance and tracking efforts to determine the impact of COVID-19 on high-risk populations in Houston currently. And finally, last but not least, our, fi our final expert is Dr. Robi Bhattacharya, who is an infectious disease physician scientist at Harvard's Mass Gen Hospital. And when he's not on the front lines treating COVID-19 patients, he is helping develop diagnostics at MIT Harvard's Broad Institute to detect superbugs. So to keep things casual, is it all right if I refer to everyone by their first names while we're doing this webinar? Awesome, thank you everyone. Uh, to our audience, just wanna remind y'all to submit questions live um, in our live chat through Zoom, Facebook Live, YouTube, anywhere where you're watching, anytime during the webinar. And our experts will be answering some of them at the end of this Q&A, so please stick around. All right, so currently a major hurdle in our efforts to curtail the spread of COVID-19 has been an upsurge of a lot of misinformation that's been circulating. So Miranda, let's start myth busting. Hi everyone, I'm Miranda Lewis, a virology PhD student at BCM and another co-host for today. Um, and we'll just start small with the virus SARS-CoV-2 itself. And um, the biggest misconception that I've heard is that the coronavirus is just like the flu. Yes, the flu and coronavirus are both respiratory viruses, but there are large differences between them. Tony, could you tell us some of the differences between the flu and the novel coronavirus? I will be happy to do so, but, but if I may, I would first like to say a few things. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank the co-host for inviting us uh, to be here to share our experiences with the general public. Uh, second, I really would like to uh, reach out to all individuals who have been affected by COVID-2. And there are a lot of individuals that have. And, 
And as a physician, uh, my heart goes out to y'all. Um, I know that there, there's a lot uh, that's happening around, but I also would like to do it in a positive note. Uh, and that is that I think in no time uh, since I've been around, have I seen uh, such uh, solidarity in trying to battle uh, the COVID-2 or SARS uh, COVID-2 uh, virus. And I think from that, uh, we as society will gain a lot uh, a lot of positives. Um, and now to go back to, to the question that you asked, what is very unique about this coronavirus is that we have never seen it. Uh, and so we do not have any population immunity. And that means everybody is susceptible to this virus. And because this is a virus that jumped from an animal reservoir to humans, they tend to be more virulent. And so we've seen that. We've seen a greater amount of mortality uh, in uh, some age groups that we know that uh, influenza also attacks. So this virus is, is unique in that we've never seen it. And that makes us as humans very susceptible to the consequences of it. All right, thank you so much for that, Tony. And thank you for the heartfelt message at the beginning. Um, um, because we've had, um, you know, ex pre-exposure to the flu and we have vaccines and treatments for the flu, do you expect that some existing treatments for influenza will work for coronavirus and possibly comment on why you think that is? So I, I would say it a little bit differently. And that is, um, there have been a lot of, of drugs uh, that have been developed but they haven't found a home. And a good example of that is gonna be remdesivir, where it's finding a home in the battle against uh, coronavirus uh, two, COVID-2. And so we will see uh, drugs that have been uh, utilized in the past that are gonna be screened to see how potent they may be against this new coronavirus, and then put into well-designed placebo-controlled trials or comparator design trials to see their effectiveness. So, so I think that's gonna be happening as well that we already know some of the major uh, targets of the virus that one can design appropriate interventions, appropriate small molecules uh, products to try to intervene in its either attachment or replication phase. Um, and so I think these are gonna be happening uh, as we develop new drugs, or as we develop the current drugs, you're gonna see next generation drugs uh, pipeline develop so that over time, we will be a lot more efficient and capable of treating this virus. Vaccines will take a little longer. All right, thank you so much. Um, I think we can see how you know this novel coronavirus stands out from the existing flu. Uh, Bailey, how have you been feeling about the outbreak? So I think like a lot of people, um, I know just the people who I've interacted with and my family and friends back home, a lot of people feel pretty anxious about a lot of the unknowns and the uncertainties that have come from this pandemic. I mean, I remember, I vaguely remember H1N1 during 2009, I was in high school, but it wasn't enough to really where it affected my daily life. So now we're all in the middle of this global pandemic and none of us really have experienced this ever. And the only thing we have it to compare to is these dramatizations like movies, Contagion, for example, which really don't depict real life. So a question we have um, for Blake is what does, what makes COVID-19 a major pandemic and not just an outbreak or an epidemic like SARS or things we've seen before? Sure, I think that's a, an excellent, excellent question. And I think the biggest piece of this, right, is that SARS, MERS, so SARS-CoV, this is, this is also called SARS-CoV-2 if we look for the actual name that we call the virus here. And it's very similar to SARS. It's also very similar to MERS, which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome that we saw pop up a few years ago. And so I think there's a lot of lessons to learn from what we saw SARS and MERS do in those smaller outbreaks. But this is actually something that we see a lot in viruses that come from animals into humans is we see them kind of bounce back and forth a bit. And what makes this virus so different is it was a little bit more transmissible 
than what we saw from SARS and MERS and was able to make that jump into humans and then spread more effectively. So we see this a lot. Actually, you see this with things like Ebola, where there's an animal reservoir that houses this virus on a normal time frame. And every once in a while, it jumps out of the animal reservoir into people. It causes an infection, which is what we saw with SARS and MERS, those small outbreaks. And then it goes away. It kind of dies off. With this one, it's not dying off at this point. It is much more global and it has caused what we are calling this pandemic, which is essentially an outbreak or an epidemic at a global scale. And it's something that I think that's where we see the difference is it's more transmissible than those that have come before it. But it is something that I think, you know, it'll be a theme in my responses is we can learn from other viruses. This isn't the flu, this isn't MERS, but there are commonalities to those things that epidemiologists we can use to model transmission, model how this is going to look over the future. And we're going to, of course, continue to gather new information and continue to develop new information that we can then impact public health efforts here, but we can learn from those viruses that came before us. Blake, would you also say that increased travel now compared to over 10 years ago when the SARS um, outbreak happened has contributed to this spread? So absolutely. So actually, this is one of the, the biggest concepts I teach my students in our infectious disease epidemiology classes is we no longer think about infectious disease emergence in terms of miles. It's not how far apart London is from Paris. It is now how long an airplane takes to travel. And so we are, as a globalized economy, as a globalized population, much, much more mobile than we ever were before. And so it allows for these viruses to transmit. And the novel H1N1 in 2008 is a great example of this as well. When we started looking for that one, that one was pretty much everywhere already already because of how quickly our population moved around. And as a point, you had mentioned, Bailey, that you were in high school at that point. So that was actually my first year in my PhD program for epidemiology. So that's one of those things that pushed me into infectious disease epidemiology because I got to see in real time how these emerging pandemics could evolve and emerge. I actually got that novel H1N1, which was terrible. Uh, really one of the worst sick illnesses I've ever had, but it, it was one of those things that galvanized the next generation of epidemiologists in my group of, of friends. And I think we're gonna see the same here. As, as, as Tony had said, I think there's things to learn here and there are positives here. And I think I'm hopeful that science, with scientists learning how to communicate better, we'll have a better way of, of expanding and explaining our knowledge to others. And I think it'll also show the next generation of scientists why it's important to tackle these very critically important problems. Thank you so much for that explanation, Blake. Um, in, increased, in, in addition to increased travel that helps spread this virus, um, Tony, is there anything biologically different about SARS-CoV-2 and the original SARS that makes CoV-2 a more dangerous or transmissible virus? The answer is yes. Um, what is different is that this virus is behaving more like a human virus in the sense that it is able to efficiently transmit from one human to another to another. There's a, a term that um, in the epidemiology world, and, and Blake would know this very well, what we call the r naught, the replication number for this virus. It's even higher than flu. And flu, the r naught is, is relatively low. But what that says is that for every individual that one is, let's say you're sick, the r naught for, for uh, COVID-2 is about three. Three other individuals will get infected. And so you can spread it. Somebody that is infected can potentially spread it to three other individuals. And you can see how rapidly the exponential curve would be in the spread of this virus. And that's what has happened. In a very short time period, uh, this virus jumped from animal to humans. And it jumped in a way that it already found humans as a good niche for virus replication. Uh, and it will likely adapt over time to become even more efficient uh, in replicating and spread. And hopefully when it does that, it would also attenuate, become less virulent. Um, and this is what many viruses do over time. And that's something that we have seen with the pandemic influenza uh, viruses do. And that is they tend to be very hot, very virulent early on. And as they adapt more and more to the human host, they become less virulent over time. 
Thank you. So I guess we have some beacon of light for the future. What you would expect is in, in the years to come, uh, this virus will become part of our normal, uh, you could say virus family that infects us uh, and will be significantly less virulent than what it is at this time. That's what we hope. Okay, that's that was great, like a great um, explanation, Tony. So just to jump in and kind of circle back to a little bit what about what Blake was talking about, another myth that we've been seeing circulating on social media and that's even been reported by multiple news outlets like Newsweek is that COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 is a man-made virus that was generated in a lab. And that also has caused a lot of different problems socially with you know, a lot of racially charged aggression towards like Asian communities because of this. Um, but a study by experts from multiple institutions around the world has pr disproved this, that, and it showed that COVID-19 actually evolved from bats. So Blake, could you simplify how scientists are able to trace the origin of SARS-CoV-2? Sure, and so, so actually the idea that this is coming from bats is something we're still iterating on as scientists. I think there's a lot of great evidence that this is coming from bats, but we're still working on this. And I think the best way to describe how we do this is actually to look at another paper that just came out in current biology that was actually looking at pangolins as a potential source. And so pangolins are the other animal that's kind of mentioned quite a bit in this conversations of what is the reservoir for, for this. I'll be very honest and upfront, I don't think it's going to end up being pangolins, but it is a possibility that that is the mammal host that this jumped into before it jumped to humans. And so what we see here, and for those of you who don't know what pangolins are, I urge you to Google them. They are adorable. They're spiny anteaters. They're just really, really cute little animals. Uh, but essentially what this paper did was that they went and they were doing surveillance in, in Wuhan in the fall of last year, looking at animal reservoirs for new coronavirus uh, strains that we have never seen before. And so essentially, this is, this is a critically important effort. We've seen this in other viral discovery aspects in Africa, other parts of Asia, but they had actually gone and found two pangolins that had been imported into China that had died and had some sort of frothy mixture in their lungs. And so what they did is they took the, the, that froth, they extracted the virus out of it and extracted the RNA from that virus and sequenced it. And that's one of the things we've been looking at is this sequence similarity. And there are critical pieces like the N protein and other pieces of that genetic sequence that we're specifically looking at. But what they found in those two, two pangolins who had died in October, which is actually where we're thinking this virus may have emerged from, the virus from those pangolins was 91% the same as the SARS-CoV-2 isolate that we're seeing emerging in people. And so what we're doing in a lot of ways is to go and take a wide net and look at a lot of coronaviruses from all of these different reservoirs and see what is the most similar to the ones we're seeing infecting people. And then we can perform some kind of bioinformatics uh, I guess, detective work to really start to look and see if there are specific sequences that look like those animal reservoirs and, and trace it back. And that's what we did with MERS to identify camels as the mammalian uh, reservoir before they got into humans. And that's what we did with SARS to find bats as the population that, that led to that outbreak as well. And if I have just a second to touch on the idea too that this is a man-made virus, that's something that has been kind of a very dangerous, dangerous rumor and myth that's been spreading for a long time. And there's just simply no evidence to that in the data whatsoever. And, and I do agree that that's terrible that that's kind of coming around. And it's, I don't wanna get very, very technical about this, but if we look at kind of the modeling of how we think that SARS-CoV-2 should bind to human cells, right? Looking at a receptor binding site and the protein that allows it to attach to your cell and inject itself in, all of the modeling that people have done over the last 20 years based on data from SARS and MERS gave us a number of ways that this receptor binding site should look. The one that's in SARS-CoV-2 looks nothing like what scientists have been projecting. So if you think that this would be something that is man-made, it should look like what we've been predicting for 20 years. This is something totally new, totally different, and our models actually make it look like this wouldn't work, but it does. It's highly transmissible and we're seeing it. And so this really does look like something that naturally emerged from an animal reservoir, got into people and due to genetic drift and just kind of natural selection has evolved to be highly transmissible. I don't think there's any information here that says this is man-made at all. Great, thank you for that really great explanation and clarification. So just moving on to another common myth, I wanna ask Roby to jump in on this. So one thing that I've heard circulating around um, is that as we move into summer and there's gonna be some intense summer heat, 
Um, there's some talk that COVID can actually be killed by the summer heater and will come in seasons and waves. So Roby and any of you who want to jump in, what do you think about these different things about the summer heat killing the virus? Uh, so first of all, I'd like to echo what Tony and Blake have said to thank the organizers for the opportunity to join um, and everyone who's watching uh, for their interest, hopefully at home, uh, for their interest. Um, in terms of the specific question about seasonality, I think that you know there's a few ways to approach this. The bottom line is we don't know how this virus will behave. Um, I think it's too glib to say we have no way to, to guess though. So we, we can model based on other coronaviruses. Um, and I think it's a little hard to do with SARS and MERS because they were relatively contained to geographic areas and periods of time, but there are other coronaviruses that cause common colds. Uh, that are similar. They're certainly not the same as this virus, but they're related. And as um, coronaviruses that cause disease in humans go, um, you know, they're the closest mimics we have. Uh, and there is some seasonality to that. Uh, however, uh, there's been some modeling work, actually some out of the Harvard School of Public Health by colleagues of mine that suggests that while even if there were some seasonal peaks and valleys to the infectivity, the fact that we don't have any pre-existing immunity, there's no reason to think that's gonna make it go away. So it's that number of people who get infected by one individual may go down, but it, there's no reason to think uh, that it would go down low enough that on its own, that's gonna make it go away. The other place we can look is places that are warmer than say the US where we are now. And we're seeing unfortunately plenty effective transmission in a lot of countries near the equator uh, where the weather has been warmer, where the humidity has been higher. And so um, I certainly wouldn't bank on it disappearing this summer. Great, thanks so much for that um, answer. So finally, just one last thing in this section when we're talking about outbreaks, um, to any of you, we know that the virus uh, can tr transmit person to person like Tony had mentioned, but also from contact with contaminated surfaces. And a study that came out um, with researchers associated with the CDC and the NIH have shown that COVID-19 can live up and live in the air for up to three hours and then on surfaces for up to three or for you know quite a long time. Can you all comment on that? So I'd, I'd like to start just because this is a, an absolutely amazing epidemiology concept. So this idea of surfaces as a source of infections is something that we, we talk about a lot. So these surfaces are referred to as fomites and I've actually seen this in the literature and in the news a lot. And it's one of those things I just wanted to define because I think it's helpful to know what this means. Um, and so essentially a fomite is any surface that has a bacteria, a virus, a fungi on it that is able to be touched by someone else and that person picks up the infection. We also refer to this as indirect transmission. And so that's just a meaning that there's a person then your inanimate object, your surface, and then another person. And it's not directly person to person, it's through something else. And so this is something that we see a lot. We know that this is something that is important in bacterial, fungal, and viral transmission, uh, and is relatively common. I think my favorite example of this is norovirus in cruise ships. Essentially, people on, on cruise ships end up getting norovirus a lot. It used to be called the cruise ship disease. And essentially that's because it's on surfaces. Most of that contact is you touch the buffet handle, someone else has touched it, and then you come down with norovirus. So we know quite a bit about this method of transmission and it is something that we're starting to learn more about. Um, but essentially, I mean, I guess to wrap up kind of my thoughts on this, we know that it can last on paper products and cardboard for about a day. Plastic surfaces, metal surfaces are potentially up to five days and the air is up to three hours in stagnant air. We don't necessarily know at this point what happens in windy environments or environments with a lot of air circulation and there are people that are actively working on this. But I think the biggest piece of this is, is treat surfaces like they have something on it and disinfect them and please, please, please wash your hands. Even in the not an outbreak pandemic, wash your hands. That's the best way to cut off transmission and cut off the ability of these viruses, bacteria, and fungi to cause these infections. So if you touch a surface and it's on your hand, but then you wash that hand, it's gone. And that's really the critical piece here. And stop touching your face. And stop touching your face. <laughs> Not, don't it. touch your face. We all touch your face more than we think. Stop touching your face. Hands below your shoulders. If I may add to, to uh, Blake uh, and uh, Ruby's comment, um, when a virus or when a virus is maintained within the air, um, it's basically a small particle. And it's what we would call small particle aerosol transmission. 
And those can go directly into the lungs as you breathe. Uh, and they tend to be even more dangerous because they bypass the upper respiratory tract. And there is some of the infection control measures that become very relevant as one uh, wanders or walks around. And that is wearing a, a face mask to help decrease the risk for small particle transmission. It's not perfect, but it will help uh, decrease it. And then uh, just to echo what has been stated, fomites can last, especially on solid surfaces, they can last. And you don't know what is contaminated and where it's contaminated. And so having very good hand washing techniques, very good respiratory etiquette techniques, social distancing is a wise choice at this time to help reduce one, the uh, spread of the virus, and two, the accidental uh, infection uh, of the virus. So do good infection control, <laughs> everybody. Great, thank you very much. That was fantastic. All three of our experts did a great job answering those questions. So Aisha, um, I know that you've been involved in some COVID testing and it, that's really stressful and hard. How have you been doing and holding up with all of this? <laughs> Uh, thanks, Bailey. Um, it's been hard. Uh, I'm training still as a clinical microbiologist, so I have a lot to learn, and I finished my PhD a month ago and was kind of thrown in the middle of it and had to start developing and running COVID testing on the ground, so it's been exhausting, but I'm also overwhelmed by our community support and, and solidarity, so uh, that's been beautiful to see, uh, like Tony said at the beginning. Um, so now I want to dive into the clinical picture a, a little bit. It's really hard uh, to tackle rapidly spreading pathogens because their symptoms, severity, and target host can be a mystery, so it's a race against time. Uh, we're struggling to understand how the virus works at the same time as it's infecting people and spreading. Uh, so this is for Roby. Uh, many questions that people asked us were, how do I know if I have COVID? And I know there's now a better understanding of common symptoms like fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath. But Roby, I know you were on clinical service recently at MassGen in Boston. Uh, thank you for being on the front lines. How hard was it in, in real time to diagnose COVID patients based on symptoms? Yeah, so it's a great question, Aisha, thanks. And also thank you for the hard work you've put in. I think the Clin Micro Lab, uh, people working in the clinical microbiology lab may be the busiest people I know right now. And that's saying something because kind of everybody in my line of work is busy right now. Um, so yeah, it, it's hard and it's also a moving target for so many reasons. Um, we're learning more about the illness as we go. And one of the things that wasn't immediately clear, say thinking back to January, but has become very clear now is that some people are not symptomatic at all and still infected. Um, some people, actually it seems like most people are probably infectious before they have symptoms, sometimes for days before they have symptoms. And I think that's part of the reason that it has done what it's done where SARS did not. And I think there are maybe molecular reasons for that and others, but fundamentally, if you're, if you're transmissible before you're sick, that's a hard thing to contain. Mm -hmm. the, the other reason it's, reason it's been tough, uh, so um, our hospital had its first cases in March, and by mid-April, it was more than half of the cases in our 1,000-bed hospital. Yeah. Um, and so it was different early on in early March. It was actually quite rare, but over a matter of just a couple of weeks, it became anyone. Someone, you read this out. We read this out of New York before we saw it in Boston. If someone comes in for a sprained ankle and you test them, they also, it turns out, have COVID. Like just so many people, um, many of whom there is. So there is very much a classic set of symptoms, um, fever, dry cough, muscle aches. Um, uh, in some cases, the change in taste and smell. Um, None of those are all that specific to this though. And, and there's such a range of severity that we, we don't fully understand that it's, it's, it, it can be tough to tell. Yeah. Um, so we, we test at our hospital, we're now testing everyone coming in. And I'll say that for those who aren't familiar with the Massachusetts community, we're, I think we're the number three state in the US in terms of cases um, behind New York and New Jersey. And so it's probably more common here than most of your viewers uh, at home. But for us, that's the policy we've adopted is to just test everyone because it can be a little bit hard to tell. Right. And, and on that note, because you did mention that people can be infectious before they know they have symptoms, do we have a better idea now of what the incubation period and how long people can be contagious? Sure. So um, it seems like it's also quite variable. Um, and I will add that 
what we mostly are able to measure is whether we can make copies of the viral uh, genetic material, which isn't quite the same thing as being contagious. In fact, it might be quite different, right? It's mm. sort of like, um, I don't know, maybe this isn't a great analogy on the fly, but it's like finding bones instead of an animal. Like you know that an animal was there, but you don't know if you're finding a fossil or it may not be the live thing, right? So we're making copies of the genetic material. From epidemiologic modeling studies that maybe Blake has more expertise to discuss than I do, I, I think it's quite clear that in the four, you know, up to four days before you're, um, you are symptomatic, you can spread. Right. We also know that out to two weeks and sometimes even longer in the, there's like a long tail that people can spread this material that we can make copies of. I'd say it's not as clear whether you're infectious for all that long, but we're telling people to quarantine for two weeks because of that. Right. Right. And I know, um, you know, it's more severe in high risk groups and they've seen the highest mortality, but I think uh, a myth that early on started and still I think is very prevalent is many people have a false sense of security uh, because they think that COVID uh, does not affect young adults. Uh, so Roby, I think, you know, I'll start with you and then Tony, of course, uh, uh, because you're a PD Pete's doc, please provide insight. The CDC in March started reporting that 38% of hospitalizations and half of ICU patients were young adults between the age of, you know, 20 to 54 years old. So Roby, on the ground when, when, when you were on service, uh, are young patients hospitalized and severely ill with COVID? Uh, the short answer is yes, uh, absolutely. So um, there were folks on my list. Uh, so as an, as an infectious disease consultant, um, I'm asked to see, essentially by the time I got on service April 1st, I was asked to, we were asked to see only the sickest folks in the hospital. And while that gives me a sense of what's possible, it doesn't give me the best sense of denominator. And so when you read, the likelihood of getting that sick um, is lower the younger you are. I think the risk of critical illness just about doubles with each decade of life and peaks at a really terrifyingly high uh, number in folks over 80. Um, but it, it's, it's lower as you get younger. But this disease is common enough that people are getting sick. And I'll also say that you know, we've done the comparison to flu. Flu does the same thing. It's, it's more severe in the elderly and then in the very, very young. This seems to also be more severe in the elderly, but every age group is about as best we can tell, 20 times more likely to get critically ill and to die from this. Um, and so, yeah, it, it happens. There's enough, it, it, is, it has infected enough people that young people are getting very, very sick. Some young people are dying from this. Yeah, and I, I think uh, you brought up an interesting point. Uh, Tony, out of curiosity, I, I, do we have a better idea now of why young kids are not getting as sick as Roby just mentioned? Do we know why it seems like a mystery and it's hard for people to understand? Um, that's an excellent question, and, and I will not give you an answer. Um, we do know, um, as Robbie was saying, that young children will get sick and can have severe uh, consequences, and some can die. Mm -hmm. But age uh, and male gender and uh, underlying health condition are major risk factors uh, at this time for severity of disease. What we don't have a good handle on is what's the actual attack rate, uh, because many cases are asymptomatic. We know that uh, traditionally for respiratory viruses, children have been kind of the engine of, of an outbreak. Uh, they're very susceptible to the infection, uh, and they uh, interact strongly with the family, and then family members go out to the community. So they're a beautiful vector for transmission of the virus within the household and out. But what's unique right now is the population at whole is susceptible. So everybody in a way uh, can be able to spread the virus very efficiently. And what we see primarily are those who are greatest at risk, those who require hospitalization. So what we're seeing is, is somewhat biased until one starts to develop good community outreach programs in a way to understand the, the true impact of uh, the attack rate and asymptomatic spread. And slowly that type of data will come out. But as we develop that data, it's gonna change because our population is gonna start to develop immunity. And once the population starts to develop immunity, you're gonna see probably like we see for flu and other uh, respiratory viruses, is who's most at, uh, at risk for the infection. And those are gonna be the young because they have not been exposed. 
as compared to older folks. So I think this is gonna be a moving target. One now, as the population is naive uh, or uninfected and slowly it will get infected. And later as we have a uh, population immunity or an infected population, you will have cohorts, you will have small groups that right. will remain susceptible because they haven't seen it yet. Right. Thank you, thank you. Yes, that I think provides a lot of clarity, uh, especially when we're talking about target hosts. Uh, Roby, uh, last quick question before we switch to some public health epidemiology stuff. Um, there's no current uh, approved, fully approved FDA uh, drugs uh, for COVID. How hard uh, is it for you and your colleagues when you're uh, treating patients, especially with uh, severe COVID cases uh, in terms of length of how long you're treating them? And I guess with that caveat, um, how hard is it to treat, for example, poor and uninsured people who might have severe COVID cases? Yeah, so thanks again for that question. I will say that um, I've given this a lot of thought, all of us at the hospital have. Um, and it's, I would say it's really a challenge to treat people for whom we don't have effective therapies. It's not something I'm accustomed to as an infectious disease doc. And as someone who has devoted my career until this point, really to understanding and, and, and approaching antibiotic resistance, I, I feel like I've worried about the specter of untreatable infections more often than I've seen them. And so to have something that is this common and this potentially fatal not have effective therapies was really hard uh, when I was on service. That said, um, and uh, kudos to all the folks on the real front lines, I would say that nurses, respiratory therapists, and, and, and sort of primary teams who are going in, custodial staff who are cleaning, like folks who are really patient facing that we don't always uh, acknowledge, um, have done a, a heroic job and are able to actually um, really keep patients alive, uh, sort of supportive care, what is sometimes referred to as, as, a, as a throwaway term in medical context at times is, is just critical. And doing that well is what's keeping people alive and pulling people through this. And in fact, when we think about sort of societal strategies to deal with this, a lot of it is allowing us to provide that society, that supportive care, not overwhelming our health system, having enough ICU beds, having enough beds so that the doctors and nurses and, and respiratory therapists and the whole team can take care of people. You asked about um, uh, underinsured, uninsured populations and, and, and care of, of that group. I will say that I personally have actually been fortunate that all of, I did my medical training in San Francisco um, at UCSF and my, all of my medical career in Boston where um, we have Romney care in Massachusetts and, and San Francisco had a city policy where almost everybody in the city of San Francisco, almost everybody in the state of Massachusetts is eligible for some degree of coverage. Um, I've been blessed not to have to think about that at all. And I strive to never, I never know the insurance status of my patients and I do my best for them. It's a different question at a societal level. And honestly, one that I is very challenging and one that I'm not an expert at dealing with, but, um, you know, in terms of caring for the patient in front of you, the ability to provide a long time of supportive care, some of which is you know, tens of thousands of dollars a day for a bed in the ICU is critical for keeping people alive. We have nothing that really can shorten that. Again, with a caveat, you said nothing approved and there's some status changes around remdesivir in the last day or two and we can all hope. Um, it seems like it shortens length of hospital stay, but it seems like it's, it's a bit early to know. We don't see the data and it may be a marginal effect. So yeah, fundamentally the question you asked is a great one and it's a real challenge. Yeah, and uh, just a reminder to our audience, we will dive into the details of everything related to treatments and vaccines and testing tomorrow, discuss what's in the pipeline and the caveats. Um, and now transitioning over to a little bit about uh, public health measures that we've used to curtail spread. Um, with COVID-19, when it emerged, public health officials, I think, to, took a very similar approach like SARS in 2003, detecting people that had symptoms and then guiding isolation and quarantining. But clearly that didn't work. And, and we've, all our speakers have brought up, it's because there's so many asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people that can still, uh, that can still spread. Uh, Tony, on that note, a lot of questions that we got from the audience uh, was about, is that common? Is that common for the virus to be able to uh, infect people without making them sick and spread silently and use that to their advantage? And then how does it then adapt to the host? Do viruses just normally mutate to become less virulent or less dangerous? Uh, so I think those questions uh, were a lot of uh, people aren't understanding how viral evolution might work. Um. Oftentimes, I have tried to take the view of being a virus. Um, 
And what does a virus really want to do? A virus wants to be able to, because it cannot replicate on its own, it needs someone, it needs a living host. And so it wants to be able to infect that host and basically say, don't recognize me. I'm here, but don't recognize me because if you do, you're gonna get rid of me. And so the best adapted viruses are viruses that can just co-live with the individual and not cause too much symptoms and the body doesn't recognize you too well and everybody is fine. Uh, and you see these major differences when a virus jumps from animals to humans uh, in the sense that their virulence, and that is how bad are they to the, to the individual, uh, and oftentimes we think of virulence as death. What's the likelihood of you dying? You see this with uh, the avian influenza viruses that are not well adapted to humans that have high mortality rate. You see that with MERS and SARS, they have high mortality rate. But once a virus becomes well adapted to humans, it doesn't want to be recognized. And so you see the mortality rate drop greatly. And a good example is the virus that causes the common cold. It can live, it can be within you. Uh, yes, it can produce the common cold, but it can also stay in your body for weeks uh, and shed and get other people infected. It does very well. And there are some viruses that once uh, it infects you, uh, will stay with you forever. Uh, and so viruses really want to be able to replicate make more of their little ones and go unnoticed uh, without harming the host too much. And the viruses that are better able to do that have an advantage. And, yeah. uh, and COVID-2, it's an, it's an early virus yet. So it, it has not yet learned well, but it has learned pretty well uh, to be able to transmit. It's still causing too much injury. Correct. And, and, and I think that that leads uh, really well into our, our next question, which is about the biggest myth, I think, uh, with COVID has been uh, that it's been blown out of proportion. And I'm sure Tony, Roby and Blake, you've seen uh, the claims by the two doctors in California who essentially said that they tested some people at their urgent care and extrapolated that to say many people in the U.S. already have been exposed. So the real mortality rate is much lower and it's not that dangerous, so we need to reopen. So I'm gonna ask that to, all, it's, it's a question for everyone, starting with Blake though. How do you respond to that? Because I know uh, you're working on a surveillance study. Right, so, so the biggest problem with that, and I will say that I haven't seen that video, but I've read quite a bit about it because it was actually pulled down for being misinformation well before it ever crossed my, my, my inbox. But essentially, the biggest problem with that kind of claim that they made there is they were testing people who were in an urgent care facility. These are sick people approaching healthcare. Generally, this doesn't include any healthy people, which we actually need to know who is sick and who is not sick to ever make any claims about the proportion of individuals who are sick, herd immunity, any of these other big kind of claims that are being made. And essentially the problem with that video is, is their sample was incredibly, incredibly biased. They only tested people coming into an urgent care facility their denominator is entirely wrong for figuring out how many people are actually infected. And essentially that's just misinformation and not helpful for the conversation. So what we actually need here and what I would pr honestly personally prefer to talk about is less, less about the issues with things like that video and more about what we should actually be doing and how we should actually be thinking about these things. What we actually need are these truly what we call cross-sectional, which is capturing a random portion of our population making and looking and see how many of those people are infected, how many of those people are not infected, and how many of those people have evidence of an infection in the past. And that's what we really need to be able to understand how, how impactful is this virus and how much of this is actually impacting our population because we have major portions of our population that don't have access to healthcare. And I'm very glad that there are parts of the country that have very kind of equal access, such as Massachusetts, parts of California, but in Texas, we don't have that. And so there are populations here that don't have access to healthcare, are not being tested and are being turned away when they come to get tested. And so we don't know anything about that. And that's where projects like we're, what we're trying to roll out here in Houston are so critical. We're actually starting to look at, and I'll keep this very quick, but we're starting a surveillance project in high risk groups here in the Houston area 
starting with grocery store workers, then we're gonna move to first responders and EMTs. We are looking at uh, homeless population here. We're looking at other groups like sex workers to be able to see what their rates are as well because they don't have any access and they are underreported and they're, they're higher risk compared to other groups around us. And those are the pieces of information we actually need to understand this. And what we're doing is we're taking swabs to look at active infection. So that's, as Roby mentioned, detection of the actual virus. And that says who's infected now or who has virus now. And then we're taking blood to look at the serum, which lets us look at antibodies and see who was infected in the past. And those are the numbers that we're going to need as epidemiologists to really understand the impact of this virus and how much of our population has had it yet. But mm -hmm. there's no, no evidence out there from actually well-controlled experimental right. studies that say that we have anywhere near herd immunity or any of these other aspects mm -hmm. that are going to be pr protective. We are still at the beginning of this infection and the vast majority of our population is naive. As we get more information, we will of course be better able to say who, what proportion of our population has had this and we'll get those incident rates and our mortality rates even more dialed in. But stuff like that's the, 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 the video from the urgent care clinic is just not helpful in these conversations right. and it's misinformation right. that distracts. Right, and Tony and Ravi, both of you are um, infectious diseases physicians. So if we're accounting for asymptomatic cases, population density and, and low testing rate, a lot of people have still asked us then, how do we estimate COVID mortality rate it, to be able to tell that it's worse than the Spanish flu so, or other outbreaks? So I'll, I'll start with that. And I would sort of, I would say that that's not, uh, I don't find that a particularly useful way to uh, to frame the debate. And I'm not saying that you're you're doing that at all, Aisha, but just the, the question is not, how does it compare to something else? Because the context, everything about it is different. Right. In my mind, we don't ask questions at this level of detail of, of influenza. We don't have we don't test more than one out of every thousand people who actually have flu, and so then we end up extrapolating a lot of these numbers that we're trying to compare. And the other reason it's completely different goes back to what Tony said at the beginning, which is we are sub, we are a population that's never seen this before, and flu is not. If influenza came around now and no one had ever seen it, like to a naive population, it would be horrible. And we, we should do our best to get to not just let it ravage through the population. And that's kind of the place I feel like we're at now. And then the third thing is, let's just look at what this has done to understand what it can do. Let's learn from places that have been unfortunate enough to, to see it first, right? Mm -hmm. Wuhan hospitals were completely obliterated. Italy, Northern Italy, Spain, and even New York City to just read some of the reports of what's happened there. Um, one out of every 500 people living in the city of New York has died of COVID in the last seven weeks. I mean, flu doesn't, ha flu doesn't do that now. And I say that as someone with a lot of respect for flu, as long as we're all giving our, revealing our age indirectly. I was a resident during the H1N1 pandemic. I saw a lot of young people get very, very sick. Some of them die of flu. I have a ton of respect for flu. This is doing something to our population that flu right now can't. And to ask whether that's like means the virus is intrinsically worse or not, I just think is not the right question. Um, it is devastating parts of our society, and I have no reason to think it won't do that to other parts if we're not smart and careful. And to end on a bit of an optimistic note, because that sounded pretty down, um, it comes at an amazing time. So one of my mentors, uh, one of my clinical infectious disease mentors from uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital across town um, was part of the SARS response originally in China in 2004. And he gave a talk recently that reminded me until that outbreak was over, we didn't even know it was a virus at all that was causing that. It was, a, it was called severe acute respiratory syndrome, right? We, it was a syndrome, meaning we didn't know its cause. People were speculating it was some kind of bacterial infection. And it wasn't until really the control measures had gotten it essentially contained that Joe DeRisi's lab found a viral sequence um, by, uh, I believe it was microarray studies at the time, um, and, and sort of the world came to accept it was a virus. We've known since very early in this what was causing this, and that should help. It, it certainly helps us caring for patients to at least feel like we know what we're doing, and it should help us to organize our response. Had this come 20 years ago, it would have been a very different situation. If, if I may, um, I would like to kind of frame frame it um, differently, at least to the question that was asked about, you know, this is a more virulent pathogen. Uh, it's a, we know that it's causing a lot of injury uh, to many individuals. And um, there have been with, with good um, uh, social distancing, 
uh, in many communities, there has been good control of it. And it has come at a price and the, and the price has had to do with an economic price and also a mental price uh, when we do such social distancing. But you will see in many regions uh, in the United States as well, as well as in the world, is starting to open up. And to me, the question is, how do you do it in a responsible way? Uh, how do you ensure that the community remains safe uh, and that you're able really as a physician, as a, a medical center, be able to uh, respond? Because once you start opening things, you should expect that there are gonna be cases and maybe more cases. And how do you control that? And one of the things that we did not have early on in this pandemic was good diagnostics simply because we didn't have it. Uh, and we did not have the capacity to do uh, diagnostics to all that required it. And we didn't have the reagents, but that's changing. And so in our response to opening up, slowly opening up, contact uh, becomes very important. Being able to do appropriate uh, uh, testing uh, for individuals that are sick and uh, do trace contact to try to uh, maintain and curtail spread of the virus will become very important because we need to reach a good equilibrium where we are keeping our population safe, but we're able to you know, operate as a society. Uh, and that equilibrium is gonna be hard and we're gonna each time kind of dial it in or dial it out uh, as the outbreak continues. But I would say that's really our next major task. And that is as we open up uh, our society to be more normal, uh, we need to take stock of strategies to really protect the community and yet keep things more normal. And I would just echo very strongly that social distancing still needs to occur because the virus is out there. Just because you're opening up doesn't mean that the virus is not there. Right. So and we need to take those steps. Actually. Bailey, can I, uh, can I... I think you just had a segue for uh, social distancing. Yeah, actually, Tony set me up really nice to be able to move on to our next thing we wanted to cover, which, you know, there's been all this talk about social distancing, um, different public health measures, and why are we, a lot of people are confused and some angry, like why now? Like, why are we doing this now? Um, and a lot of things that have been going around is, you know, we need to keep flattening the curve. And so exactly like Blake, Roby, anyone can touch on this. What does that actually mean? How will that continue? And will we, could we experience a second wave with all this reopening? Is that a major concern? I can start and say I, the virus hasn't changed. Uh, so only our behavior has. And I actually have been tremendously impressed how effective um, social distancing has been here, at least in the US. And it, it we can clearly see a flattening. Uh, the thing that we had all asked for as healthcare providers, New York did get overwhelmed. Our hospital actually had to, we had at our peak about 45 more ICU patients with COVID than we had adult ICU beds at the beginning of this year. We created five new ICUs. Dr. Piedra, I'm a, I, my apologies, but our pediatric ICU became an adult ICU. Um, and that's just counting COVID patients. There are a handful of non-COVID ICU patients still. And so, um, but we kept came back from that brink and a lot of the US has not gotten there. Social distancing has worked. But remember, there's probably, a, we plateaued at about probably 10 times more virus than we had when we went into lockdown. And when we come out, that virus is still there. In fact, there's more than when we locked down. And so we just, we need to be careful. We can't stay like this forever. But I do think of this that at least until there's a vaccine, I know you guys are getting to that tomorrow. I think of this as a before and after moment. Um, and we really need to live differently. We need to be more vigilant than we used to or, or like that, that's not a requirement, but the alternative is accepting a cost of a lot of sickness and death in, in our society. And neither of those is the way things used to be. Um, I do think of, I'm, I am actually hopeful that a vaccine might get us to, uh, to back to where we would like to be, but without that, I think that, yeah, we need to be cautious, we need to test, we need to continue to distance, and it has really worked, it has really made a difference. And I'd like to, to tie into there a little bit too, I think that, you know, this idea of flattening the curve is something that has been absolutely critical. So 
Roby mentioned you know, the overwhelming the hospitals in New York as, as a major issue. And that's been something that I'm sure everyone has seen on the news. And this idea of flattening the curve and these social distancing methods from a public health point of view has been ex explicitly to try to avoid overwhelming our, our healthcare systems. So the challenge here is if you don't slow the rate of new infections, we can run out of the hospital beds, we run out of critical things like ventilators. And what you will end up with is that people who would have survived with access to these care facilities and, and technologies like ventilators won't get them and they will die. And so what we're really doing here is a population is trying to come together to support each other and try to cut that transmission off as much as possible so that we can keep a healthcare response together. And a good, a good example of why this is so important is Italy. So Italy, their mortality rate currently is 12.6, which is one of the highest in the world. And part of this is because the highest number of individuals who have been infected are in the elderly population, 60 to 70, and really a lot of people in that 80 plus range. But part of it is also because their hospital system was overwhelmed and they didn't have the ability to care for everyone that is sick. What we really wanna do is implement social distancing to limit that transmission, keep our healthcare systems at, at the ability to handle what's coming in the door, and then start to look at more thoughtful measures like, like Tony is mentioning here. And we are, as we're coming out of these social distancing measures, going to see another uptick. And I think we'll probably see another big set of infections in six months. That's something we have historically seen with pretty much every novel pandemic that we've seen in the past. So the modeling all says that it's not necessarily just gonna go away. It's not, there's no magic here. But the thing we need to start thinking about are more thoughtful measures. And so this idea of contact tracing and the technology that enables that is so, so critical. We need testing infrastructure that anybody and everybody can be tested frequently. And if someone is positive for the virus, they need to then self-quarantine and they need to go do their social distancing thing and stay at home. And then we need the ability to contact those individuals that that person was in touch with to let them know that they should start maintaining and monitoring for symptoms and come in for testing. And this is exactly how South Korea has done it. And that's how they went from being one of the first peaks of this epidemic to having one of the lowest infection rates in the world. And it was all done by early and rapid availability of testing, contact tracing, and technology-based tracking of who you've been in touch with using cell phones. And that's what our next big push from a public health is going to be, is enabling these other new methods. We just simply weren't prepared to do those things when this started. And I'm hopeful in the future, we will be able to do those things immediately and get the infrastructure put in place to do that. But it, life is gonna be different and we need to start thinking and, and start adapting these other public health procedures to be able to restore some normalcy here. And I think that's gonna be the big push. And you're gonna see this kind of continued public health approach over the next six to 12 months, at least, that enables us to do those things. Thank you so much, Blake and Roby, for those um, explanations. Um, in addition to um, the social distancing that we're trying to do and contact tracing, this is all efforts that will um, be implemented for us to reopen America. Um, another concern was um, how the CDC is previously asked how, um, the public to not wear masks, saying that they wouldn't be very useful, um, especially since healthcare workers who need surgical masks and N95s were running out. Um, but recently, the CDC changed their guidelines and asked the public to wear face masks, which led to an uproar that they could have issued that guidance earlier. And even now, some people are not adhering to that. So why do you so why do public health guidelines change so frequently in the middle of an outbreak and why exactly do masks help now? So, so it, one of the things that's kind of been hit a lot here is that the public health guidelines are changing and people don't like that there's kind of this evolution of a public health response. And unfortunately, that's a part of a novel pandemic. We had never seen this before. We didn't know everything about it. And quite honestly, we weren't prepared. And as we become better prepared and we have more information, I would hope that people would be open to changing our tactics to be better and more appropriate and evolve as we move forward. And this idea of masks has been a critical one, but really initially the people were being told not to wear masks because the infection rates were thought to be relatively low. And the critical thing with a mask is it doesn't protect you from other people very well. It protects other people from you very well. And so that is the piece here. When you have a very low infectious rate and there's not masks to go around, of course you want those to be going to healthcare workers who have that critical need now for them to keep themselves and others healthy in the hospital. Giving patients that are sick a mask 
means that when they cough, they don't cough into the air, they cough into the mask and it stops it. Now that we have more infections in the community and we have wider availability of masks, what we're actually now asking people to do is wear masks to protect everyone else from you. And so what we're really trying to do now is change our approach to enable kind of the care and use of these critical PPE, personal protective equipment resources as we have them. And as things evolve, we're changing. And so now everyone should be wearing a mask, not because you're protecting yourself from others, but because you're protecting others from yourself and everyone should just act as if they are infectious. And this is about being a part of a community and a society and helping each other. And I think that's what people miss here is we're all in this together and we have to do something together. And we're not changing the rules. We're adapting and evolving as it goes. And like I said, with the next level of public health response, we'll see contact tracing and notification of people that they're in contact with as our next response. We are trying to do this better and things will change. And that doesn't mean that you know, what we were doing before wasn't appropriate in the moment. It means that the situation is evolving and changing. Thank you so much, Blake, uh, for explaining all of that so well. Um, and so with that, today we've heard from a virologist studying SARS-CoV-2, an epidemiologist dissecting COVID-19 infection rates, a doctor on the ground treating patients, and tomorrow we'll hear from a clinical microbiologist on diagnostics, testing, clinical trial experts, and physicians on new treatments and vaccines. All of them are on the front lines working to fight this pandemic, and we thank and appreciate all of them. Um, so all these parts moving forward um, need to come together to form a cohesive healthcare system. But if we have so many experts in America who can craft solutions, why was it not enough for us to adequately respond to this pandemic? Yeah, and we will start uh, answering the live Q&A in a little bit, but just to give people a flavor of what's to come tomorrow, it's really hard to talk about the science behind COVID-19 without talking about the underlying issues that created the crisis. And, and Blake, I think, said it perfectly. We need to be able to act early and we need the leadership, the coordination to be able to respond fast. Um, and our healthcare system clearly was overwhelmed and was not able to deal with this massive surge of cases. And the economic impact that we are so aware of has been severe. Millions are left uh, unemployed and marginalized communities have been hit so hard. So we understand their anger. It is justified. Uh, and we want to know that this is not happening because uh, of life-saving public health policies like the lockdown. Uh, there's a lot of misdirected anger sometimes at scientists, but for public health guidelines like quarantine to work, people can't just be told to stay home without being provided with access to social services. So they're weather able to weather the storm. Uh, so we understand all of the nuances and what we need is long-term change. Next segment, we're going to uh, discuss cutting edge scientific solutions uh, like alternative types of diagnostics, vaccines and drugs, and how science can directly inform long-term policy reform. And now we will start with taking our audience Q&A. So we've been looking at your questions. Uh, Tom Coleman is going to help us uh, moderate so we can get started. Hi there, my name's Tom. I'm a postdoc at the Rice University. And thanks to everyone for the fantastic um, answers to these questions they've provided so far. Okay, so um, I guess we can start off with a couple of questions that sort of deal with, I guess, some further uh, myths and uh, I guess things that the audience has expressed that they're concerned about. So, um, so a question here that a lot of people um, what are the infection routes through other animals? Is that is that possible or is that a myth? And can it be spread by fecal contamination? So I, I'll start with the fecal contamination one because I think that's a question I've been getting a lot lately. And I think there've been some slightly hilarious but misleading email or news releases about that lately. So can SARS-CoV-2 be spread by fecal contamination or feces in general? Uh, the answer is right now, we don't really know for sure how important this rate of, of this method of transmission is. It is theoretically possible, and we've seen that there is evidence of virus present in the feces. There are two different papers that have come out in the last week that have identified viable virus from the stool of people who are infected. And there are papers from SARS. And again, like as I mentioned before, we learn a lot from the things that came before to predict what will come next. SARS was thought to have been transmitted by stool and feces as well. We'll know a lot more about this in the future. This is not considered one of the major mechanisms of transmission that is absolutely respiratory droplet based when people cough or people who are working out and not wearing masks. 
Again, wear masks it's to help and save others from you. Uh, but again, the best thing in this, just wash your hands, disinfect surfaces. And, and as Roby said, don't touch your face. Those are really the three things here. And that immediately cuts off that method of transmission. OK, um, thanks for that. So um, another thing that a lot of people have showed some concern about is uh, whether there's any extra advice that you doctors can provide on how high risk groups can protect themselves as we begin to come out of the enforced isolation period. So I can take a stab at that. It's a, it's a great question. It's a really important question. And I think it's a hard one that we're going to have to struggle with as a society. And I think it's going to be different in different places. Clearly, I think population density plays into how much and how fast this spreads. Um, I think continuing your own form of social isolation, first of all, commun communicating with your own physician, especially those who have underlying health problems is, is of paramount importance. Um, and ideally, you know, we've set up a lot of video conferencing in, in sort of telemedicine. And if you have that option, that's maybe even better, at least at first, to understand your own personal risk as best as, as possible. But I think, you know, it, it's hard. It's going to be dependent on, to every, on everyone's individual situation. And to circle back to something that Aisha had mentioned before, like not everyone can afford to socially distance. Not everyone is equally able to. And I, I mentioned that, you know, Massachusetts and San Francisco, I haven't had to treat that many uninsured patients, but certainly underinsured and sort of those who are otherwise able to seek care. And in this case, to, to distance. It's it's hard to give a blanket answer. I would say, and so if it sounds glib to say, wash your hands and don't touch your face, I would say, First, it's, it's really important to do those things. And second, those are the things that you can control. Um, I think staying in as much as you can if you are at increased risk for severe disease is probably advisable, but everybody has to make their own choices. Great, thanks, Roby. Um, so related to that, um, another question that we had from the Zoom chat was, uh, what effect does long-term isolation have on the immune system? And is it possible that we can become more immunocompromised as we shift back into the, as we shift into um, the post shutdown period. I'll go ahead and, and take that one. Um, the answer is no. Um, our immune system uh, is a beautiful uh, system that allows you to remember things almost since you were born. So we have memory cells. Uh, and when you get infected very early, in life, those responses that were developed then actually can still modify the immune response as an adult and older adult. So our uh, immune system has learned to remember things for a long time. Um, and that is one of the reasons that vaccines can become very effective because we don't vaccinate, except for very few things, we don't vaccinate every year. We vaccinate a few times uh, during childhood and some boosters later on. And the reason is our body is able to remember them. The immune system is able to remember them. So having, let's say a period of a year or two where you have reduced exposure to uh, viruses will not affect your immune system. Great, thank you, Tony. That's a good answer. Um, so a further question related to that was, with that go? Um, oh yes, yeah, so um, we've also had many people asking about um, why low income and minority communities are having uh, more trouble dealing with this um, epidemic. Uh, does anyone want to comment on that? Thanks. So I, I can start with that. So one of the, as we're here busting myths, one of the early myths of this was that there were portions of our population who weren't getting infected. And part of that was really focused at younger individuals. For a while, you saw a lot of kind of comments online about how young people couldn't get this, which is patently wrong. There also have been some very racist stereotypes out there as well of certain portions of our population who are often minorities in the United States who couldn't get it either. And so that's a really dangerous, dangerous thing to say and, and to propagate because everyone is naive to this virus. Everyone is susceptible to this virus and can get it. And in addition to everyone being able to get it, when you have those kind of rumors that are out there, minority and low income individuals and low income communities often have less access to healthcare, less access to personal protective equipment, and just are in positions where they can't socially distance for a month or two months like everyone else can. Yep. So you end up with this perfect storm where kind of our silent portion of our population is the one that is the hardest hit by viruses like this. 
and that's really unfortunate. And that's why I think it is so important, as Roby was mentioning, to test everyone, have the ability for people to get treatment, and then have a better understanding of how these populations are being hit by the virus to better enable social programs that are available for the communities that are around us. Yeah, I will add that I actually don't know of any medical conditions that don't hit uh, low socioeconomic status and disadvantaged populations harder than they hit the general population. I can't think of a single one. Um, and so I think that uh, to a large extent, COVID is exposing differences that already exist, disparities that already exist, and the ability to seek care and the ability to perform self-care and the luxury to socially distance. Um, I, I know of no biological explanation for this, and I, my strong hypothesis is that it's not biological, that it's social. Right, and I think uh, we'll kind of dive into this tomorrow, but when we talk about public health, like Blake said, we it's not just about preventing the disease itself, but addressing the underlying uh social issues that created bad health in the per first place and allowed for further exacerbation of uh, dis health disparities and inequities. So thank you, Roby. I think that was a great distinction uh, to make. And I might expand just to say that a counterpoint to that might be, aren't there higher rates of things that we know cause increased risk, diabetes and heart disease in some, of, some minority populations? And yes, and I would say that um, it's true, it's partly because of societal differences also and, and economic and, and, and health disparities. Um, but also up, up above and beyond that, I think that it's quite clear that, that um, disadvantaged populations are being disproportionately hit beyond just what is explained by pre-existing conditions. Great, thanks Roby. Um, uh, another question we have, which uh, is, uh, will the virus, uh, will, sorry, Will virus virulence decrease over time? This seems to be um, a question that a lot of people have asked us. How in a second? Um, oh, Sam, how in a, yeah. Sorry. Um, go ahead if anyone's got a response to that. I'll, I'll take that one, uh, and others can chime in. A good example are the pandemic influenza viruses. One can look at the Spanish uh, pandemic of 1918. Uh, the Asian pandemic of 1957, the Hong Kong pandemic of 1968. And all these influenza viruses were never previously seen in humans. And they caused a lot of disease and a lot of deaths. In the next decade that followed, those pandemic influenza viruses became part of the seasonal flu viruses. And their virulence or their um, mortality rate, the ability to cause bad things decline over time. And that is because those viruses became better adapted to uh, infect humans. And generally better adapted viruses are less virulent or cause less human damage. And I would expect the same thing is gonna happen. And one could go back and say, where did the four human coronaviruses that circulate in humans come from? Chances are they came from animals and chances are they infected humans. And at one time they may have been pandemic viruses. We just didn't recognize them maybe 200, 300, 400 years ago, but they're now part of our normal viral flora. Uh, and so I would expect the same thing will happen over the years uh, with this particular virus. Thank you, Tony. Another, another good question we've received is, um, this is um, a verbatim. I've heard that people who have recovered from COVID have tested positive again much later, leading to speculation that the virus has reactivated or they got reinfected. Can you comment on whether this is a myth or not? So I, I can start and I'll say that I think this is actually one of the most important questions that like our species faces, <laughs> because a lot of what we're talking about here is, is based on the hope um, that we generate protective immunity upon infection. And I don't think that that is a given, although I think that it is certainly everyone's hope and probably expectation based on our normal immune response to most viruses. Um, there have been a lot of reports, they understandably of, of sort of repeat viremia detected in patients. I have yet to see a single report that I believe represents true infection true reinfection. And some of it comes back to that distinction I was making earlier, which is we're kind of just making copies of the viral genetic material. We're not, I, I, there's no cases in which I'm even aware of active, of like sort of live culturable virus being detected again. And most of the cases I think would be adequately um, explained by 
uh, a false negative viral test at one point and just sort of prolonged shedding, which we know happens a lot. So someone did get truly infected, has maybe controlled it, and and has continued to shed it over time. I don't think we know this for it to be a to be a definite truth yet. And I think until we start to get farther, until there's just more time, we can't know this. And I think it's 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 really critical because we want immunity. And also, it's I don't think we've in our history ever generated a vaccine if if in fact if primary infection is not. Um, does not generate immunity, but I th I've seen no evidence that it won't. If I may expand on that, um, we have a, a diagnostic center that I run uh, where we do extensively PCR testing for individuals. And as Robbie was saying, we have some individuals that shed genomic material for at least four weeks, um, and they are currently asymptomatic. Uh, in fact, they want to go back to work, but they're still positive. And it happens that if one does not obtain the sample correctly, it is very easy to call them negative. And this is something that happens oftentimes that we assume that you've taken a test and it's a good quality test, but that's not always the case. And with these samples that are obtained by a swabbing of the nasal pharynx, uh, sometimes the swabbing may be inadequate and not obtain the correct material to do a PCR test, yet the PCR test is done and the readout may be negative when in reality it is still positive. And so one just has to be careful there. The other is uh, to understand better the issue of infection and reinfection is something uh, that Blake had talked about before and that's sequencing. And to the general uh, public, I would say it's kind of like a fingerprint. So if you were to look at your fingerprint, that is you. And nobody else is going to have your fingerprint. Well, the virus has the same. It has a fingerprint, which we call its whole genome sequence. And if you look at that virus early in the infection and later on, it's going to be a very similar fingerprint. And that is a very good method to be able to show whether these cases are truly reinfection or just prolonged shedding that we have not seen. We missed it. I think to add to that, this idea of sequencing in infectious disease outbreaks, this is the first time, full stop, that we have been able to use sequencing to understand an infectious disease outbreak as it is occurring. So we knew this was happening at the beginning of January. There were some indications in late December and we had the first sequence of this virus by January 14. That is an incredible scientific achievement and public health achievement. In the past, it's taken us years to be able to identify even what pathogen is there. And Roby had mentioned that you know, with SARS, we didn't know what it was until after. We have been able to do contact tracing with sequencing and look at direct transmission. This actually happened in Seattle early on, which allowed us to gather a ton of information about how this virus worked. And it's something that to put a silver lining on this is that it will allow us to understand a lot about how infectious disease outbreaks happen in real time, how to enable these type of, of novel new methods that we haven't used before, and how to be better prepared in the future. And, and the biggest thing about this is we never want to make the mistakes of the past again. And so we need to focus here about enabling better early detection, early rapid contact tracing, so that we can do things much quicker and avoid these large-scale stay-at-home orders that we have today and make sure that we really set up this infrastructure for the future because we are seeing these type of large outbreaks every two to three years. Not, not nearly like so the COVID-19 outbreak has been, but Ebola, SARS, MERS, there's a, there's a laundry list of these that are coming out about every three years and the vast majority of these are coming from animals, as Tony had mentioned, which we call zoonoses. And that is 70% of new infections. So it's not a new thing. And we're learning a ton here about how to do this better so that we can avoid this in the future. And I think that's the critical piece here. And I'm gonna, uh, just for the audience uh, that might not be familiar with what sequencing is, sequencing essentially is to be able to understand the genetic code of uh, what makes this virus a virus and then be able to compare it to other similar related viruses to be able to understand how related it is, but also where it came from, how it's spreading. So it's a very useful tool that can allow us to understand uh, newly emerging pathogens. Yes, that's 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 a very good point. And um, thanks to all of the doctors for the answer on that question, especially uh, Blake's comment about the fact that this is the first time 
that we have this powerful sequencing technology. So this is really an unprecedented time for medical research. So yeah, so I think that's a very good answer and just want to highlight that again. Okay, so our next question um, is, and this is something that all the doctors I'm sure are going to have strong comments about. So is HCQ a cure for COVID-19? There are varying opinions from experts and politicians, and it can be very confusing to the informed and the non-informed public. So I'm not going to take a swing at it because I'm probably going to butcher it, but I think someone should right. say what HCQ stands for. Hydroxychloroquine and then Tony. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll start. So hydroxychloroquine is the name of the, of the drug. Um, it has a variety and it's related to a drug chloroquine. They have a variety of uses. And part of the reason we're talking about this is that it takes a long time to develop a new drug for something. Um, but the real hope for a quick response is to repurpose drugs that we usually use for other things and hope they have some effect on the virus. That's actually what remdesivir is too, even though it's more direct acting. So chloroquine is usually a parasitic drug. Actually, hydroxy hydroxychloroquine is mainly an immune modulator that's used in autoimmune conditions. Um, why might they work? Um, there's some in vitro evidence that they change the compartment within the cell that the virus first enters. And there's, in a test tube, that actually might work to make the virus have to do a less good job of infecting human cells. I also want to say that some, again, just to echo what Blake said before, some of the mixed messaging is from genuine lack of knowledge, right? So until it's tried, like there actually was a decent set of in vitro data. Um, but no clinical experience with this. And our hospital's initial guidelines were somewhat equivocal on this, but suggested that for severe cases, you might consider it. I actually think we, it's a longer discussion for another time, but philosophically, we had this desire to really try to help people. Um, one of my medical mentors said his counseling on this was don't just do something, sit there, right? So like this, this urge to, to try something um, has been a really big part of this and something that is not always helpful. Um, I think as more data has come out on hydroxychloroquine, I think it's not likely to help. And actually our hospital's guidelines during the time that I was on service in early April changed from consider to only use in the setting of a randomized controlled trial because it doesn't look like it's making a huge difference. And at the very minimum, we should do our best job to make sure we know the answer to whether or not it helps. I'm gonna jump in on this one as well. Um, as a physician, one of the things that we always need to remember is don't do harm. Um, and our impulse is always to do something uh, because that's our nature. But we always have to remember, don't do harm. And one of the issues that comes up very early when you don't have a particular drug um, or intervention is that you try everything and you hope something sticks. The reality is that if we're going to be able to develop and be able to have reiterations of improvement on antivirals, what you have to do is what's being done at this time, and that is well-controlled trials. They take a little longer at the beginning, uh, but they will give you sound data. They will give you sound information in how to move forward, and that we already probably will be seeing. Uh, shortly, because as one develops one antiviral drug, then you use that as basically as your placebo. It becomes your comparator arm so that you can then compare to what is the best available and move forward rather than inadvertently just testing anything when you don't even know whether you're doing benefit or harm. And hydroxychloroquine is an example that to use it in an uh, in immune modulator fashion, you have to use it at relatively higher doses that can cause a lot of cardiac safety issues. And that has been observed. And so I would just say um, with time, we're gonna have antiviral drugs that will be developed in a rational manner uh, in uh, causing the least amount of uh, danger, safety, ensuring safety, to the people that are enrolling in these very important trials to advance our ability to treat individuals with COVID-2. Thank you to um, Roby and Tony for that very good response. Um, I believe this is a good opportunity to ask a broad picture question, which is 
How is a strong healthcare system integral to fighting this pandemic? And what can the US specifically do to adapt to this? So I'm gonna take the first piece of this because I wanna change the way people think about what a healthcare system is. So we think of a healthcare system in the United States as a place that you go once you are sick. That is not the best way to deal with anything. We call that, it's called tertiary level response. We need to be in a preventative response for a lot of these things, which is where healthcare also encompasses public health. And so one of the things here is that in most places, we were actually with social distancing able to keep the healthcare as we think of hospitals under their capacity limits. We were able to respond appropriately, but that took some very strong social distancing and kind of community compromises and a lot of, of economic hit for that to happen. One of the critical pieces is we need a much stronger clinical diagnostic and public health effort and infrastructure to move forward so that when this kind of thing appears, we have the ability to mobilize testing so that we can see who is infected immediately and have contact tracing and networks of who is interacting in more quick access to be able to actually avoid things like wide scale social distancing. So it's critical to have good health response and great hospitals and have the ability to handle that level, but we need to better do or better our ability to have clinical testing, public health infrastructure, contact tracing, because that's how South Korea handled this. And that is why they are now considered the gold standard for how to handle the COVID-19 outbreak and the SARS-CoV-2 transmission. They relied on their excellent hospital infrastructure, but also great clinical testing and an army of public health individuals with technology at their disposal to track this and basically shut down the infection in a matter of weeks. And that's what we need to start doing for the future. I think this question is, first of all, a fundamentally tremendously important one and also completely unanswerable, at least by me. But I will say what I think, which is, so in addition to the sort of specific interventions that we will now be forced to try to work about testing and treating, I think there's a bigger question to ask about how we deliver care to people. Um, and, you know, to, to the level of, does it make any sense to have our insurance linked to our employment when something like this puts people out of work and then also makes it harder for them to access health care? And what's that going to do to everybody's health? Um, you know, I, I don't know that I... It, I don't have answers to these things, right? If anyone had answers to these, I, I would hope they would speak up, but these are matters for our society to really wrestle with. And in some ways this has given, this has put an unfortunate fine point on questions that have been lingering in our society for a long time. Um, and one would hope that care for fellow humans would be enough to motivate people to act on disparities that we've seen for a long time. Uh, this is gonna make us have those conversations as a society and I, I hope that we rebuild stronger for it but there's going to be tough, tough conversations to be had and a lot of decisions to be made. If, uh, if, can I, ahead, may I add? Of course, of course. So I'm going to uh, put a view of 30,000 feet above. Um, and I think uh, when we look at these type of huge social medical crisis, um, not only do you need a national, but you need a global response and you need a partnership that is not only public health, but you need a partnership with uh, private pharma, society, government, all working in unison to try to improve uh, our ability to respond effectively to these type of crises. Um, and if we can do that and remain um, motivated, not only after this pandemic, but remain motivated and prepared for future pandemics because they will occur. Then these type of issues that we're seeing right now are going to, in a way, be mitigated. I think one of our uh, inabilities is to sustain a long-term plan. We should have learned from the 2009 pandemic uh, that we need certain types of infrastructure, public health infrastructure in place, that we need uh, industry, uh, government, society working together uh, to have a long-term vision uh, so that we can really be able as one to respond to these crises. I don't think the public health can do it alone, uh, just like I don't think government can do it alone. 
uh, we really need uh, partnerships. Uh, and part of it, as one can see when we talk about social distancing, is in a way social responsibility. And society uh, has really come up uh, and been able to, to uh, act on it. Uh, they have played a huge role in our ability to respond to this. And so we need these type of partnerships moving down the road and be able to sustain it. Thank you, Tony. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think that was a great insight to have, see the nuances, I guess, from Roby to Blake to Tony that kind of brought it all together into a cohesive um, response. So there's, I think, a lot of uh, questions that the public has had in general about the nuances of public health guidelines and how we can understand as they shift and how to stick to them. For example, uh, why we should uh, stay six feet away from each other as opposed to 10 feet. Um, and another question that we got was, okay, if I have a close circle of friends that I trust and that I know, um, and they're following quarantine guidelines and such, then am I allowed to hang out with them? So how do we address the nuances, I guess, uh, to be able to get everyone on the same page? I can ta take on the six foot issue real quick. Um, there have been very good studies uh, and as a pediatrician, uh, and uh, I would say as Robbie, as an infectious disease person would appreciate, many years ago, there was a, a very uh, informed, uh, I would say well-known pediatric infectious disease doctor named Dr. Carolyn uh, Hall. And she did a beautiful study in children to understand how RSV is spread, respiratory syncytial virus, the major virus of young children and very important virus for older folks. And what she noted was that if you just stayed away six feet and did not touch any surface uh, within that six foot limit, uh, you did not become infected. And so we know that when you cough, you have large droplets and small droplets and they will fall out and they generally fall out within a six foot radius. And so when you cough, if you touch the surface of uh, within that six feet of, of an individual coughing, you have a high likelihood that whatever that individual has, you may be exposed to. And that's your large droplet rule. And that's where the six foot uh, radius comes from. If it's small particle aerosol, that's different. The six foot radius does not work anymore because it remains in the air and all you have to do is come in and you breathe it in. But it's the large droplet that one is really trying to uh, minimize by the six foot rule and social distancing of six feet. To, okay, to tack in the there too. One? So yeah, the, so the friends one. So this is a really interesting and challenging question, but honestly, my brain goes to the uh, sexual disease transmission kind of PSAs that from the nineties of, if you have two friends and they have two friends and they have two friends, you get exponential transmission. Two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16. And so it's not so much an issue. It's like, if you live in a house with people, you can be surrounded by the same four people, but you need to close off all the abilities for those viruses to transmit to another group of four people and then two groups of four people from there and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it's great to think that, you know, you have a very close knit group of friends that you can spend time with, but if one of those people is spending time with another group of friends that then has SARS-CoV, then you have it in your group of friends and we have this continued transmission. And the entire goal of our social distancing efforts and the sheer amount of effort that this really takes at a community level is to cut this off. So really, I mean, go online, hang out with your friends online, use Zoom, use WebEx, use Teams, whatever you wanna do and hang out with people that way and you can do the same things and just don't sit in the same room. It's the quite simply the easiest way to make sure that the virus does not continue to transmit. And I think the UK did this in an interesting way as well in saying that if you have a new relationship, think very hard if you wanna spend the next six weeks with that person because you're not leaving, you're staying together. And so in a lot of ways, we're all making sacrifices in who we do spend time with and don't spend time with. Leverage the fact that we have incredible technology at our fingertips and spend time with them just differently. It helps. Yeah, I think that was a great way to <laughs> kind of put that to bed. Um, we did have a little bit more of a, um, I guess, medical question about uh, high risk. 
So uh, Roby, um, are people with uh, asthma, high blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera, that's under control, uh, still high risk? And I think this one's interesting. Do, is there any correlation or are there any studies that show there's a correlation between severity of hypertension, for example, or, uh, or blood pressure with how much of a risk that you have of, of COVID, of getting COVID? Yeah, so I think that's a hard question to answer, really, just because it's so early still in the epidemic. I think that these kind of observational studies are hard and need to be done very carefully to remove confounding, because by the way, a lot of people with diabetes also have high blood pressure and, and vice versa, and there's a lot, of, a lot of these run together. And so to be able to distinguish, I have not yet seen data that would be able to distinguish level of severity or level of control. Um, and then there's also, there's differences between likelihood of actually getting any symptoms at all, likelihood of getting disease severity. There are enough variables there. I think we just don't know. There are important questions. I wish I had answers to them, but I think as a society, we don't really know for sure. No, yeah, I think that's well put. Um, uh, the, we wanted to end on, on a question. I think that will be a great transition to be able to talk about these issues tomorrow. And, and again, this is something for everyone, which is, um, do you think uh, frontline workers and uh, people that are at the uh, at the forefront of fighting this pandemic, do you think they were given the provisions they need, uh, like protection, but also hazard pay and things like that, um, for putting themselves and their families at risk? And how important are things like that to have already in place for a pandemic response? I think it's critical. I mean, I think if you look at some places, so Trader Joe's is giving their employees $2 extra an hour right now for as a thank you for taking on the risks. They've installed plexiglass walls in front of all the registers and everyone gets PPE when they walk in the door. So they get masks and gloves, but it took them a little while to get there and not everywhere is there. And we also see examples of in New York early on in this outbreak where there were people in some of the hospitals wearing trash bags as lab coats and things like that. We and we, we're doing the absolute best we can as a society, but we were not prepared for this. And we have not been protecting those most vulnerable amongst us in, in the ways that we should be. And so I think that this is a learning experience in a lot of ways. And we need to do better always and continue to do better and use evidence-based and science-based information to refine the ways that we deal with these things. But we need to always kind of learn from, from what we've done and try better in the future and be prepared for these things because they're going to come back. Yeah, I'll echo that completely and say that it's a real challenge for society, right? We have this sort of just-in-time economy where it's it's best for everyone's business to only have what you need on hand, but that makes it really difficult to adapt. And when this is a really unusual event, right? Like this happened to everywhere in the world all at once, and everybody's supply chains are interdependent, and everybody's needs magnified all essentially synchronously. That never happens, and we, we're not ready for it, right? I will say that I feel very fortunate that our hospital sort of ramped up, and it is such a critical part of everyone on the care team being able to take the kind of care of the patients that they want to take to be able to feel safe and to feel that I'm not going to be putting my family at risk when I come home at night, that it is an absolutely critical thing to do. Um, but uh, but it wasn't easy, and I think everybody did their you know everybody tried their best, and I agree that we need to do better going forward. And I I would just say that um, I would look at it like a team. Um, you really have to work all together. Uh, no one is an expert in everything. Uh, some people are going to have good information, let's say in logistics, uh, logistical issues. Some people are going to have good information in, in infection control, uh, in uh, business networking. Um, and so is putting minds together is really working as a, a major team to try to come up with relevant solutions. Uh, it's the way that I think we're going to have to uh, move forward. And I think that's what this pandemic is providing. It's, it's really uh, making us go away from silos to really think about uh, teamwork uh, at a major level. Exactly, thank you so much, Tony. And, and, and for all, to all our experts, thank you so much for being here, Roby, Blake, and Tony. This, is, this was incredible. And I mean, we had hundreds of people here today. We answered so many questions. This was phenomenal. Um, from both uh, ASM, uh, TMC, and Taste of Science Houston, thank you so much. 
Uh, we are going to continue tomorrow where we will continue answering a lot of your questions that you asked today. So don't worry, we will get to them. Tomorrow, we're going to put a spotlight on discussing future solutions, uh, not just to see how we can get our way out of this, uh, but how we can be better prepared for the future. So we're gonna put a spotlight on testing and diagnostics and innovative treatments and vaccines in the pipeline, but also how we can use that scientific evidence to inform future policy changes. Um, so again, please uh, come back 2 p.m. Central tomorrow. Uh, and we're gonna put up a, a slide right now to uh, how you can support us if you liked what you saw. Um, ASM TMC, we are um, a community organization and a scientific society, but we run an outreach program that brings microbiology and infectious diseases education to undeserved, uh, underserved communities. Um, and Taste of Science also continues to put on education events just like this. So if you would like to continue supporting us, I'll put up a slide on how you can do that. Again, let's all wave and thank you to our experts. Um, you've been incredible and insightful. Thank you so much to our audience and we will see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, Olivia. <laughs>